Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking about uh, defamation when it comes up. So defamation is, is perhaps the other main tool for, for tracking magma um, when it's still within the crust uh, after seismicity. Measurement of gas is, is a third, um, but in, certainly in Iceland, uh, seismicity and defamation have been the two main tools for, for tracking magma. So the, the basic idea is if you have a pressure change within the crust, then you're going to deform the earth, the crust around it, and we can detect this by measuring displacement at the surface. Um, so if you have magma moving within the earth, this changes the pressure, redistributes the pressure, and we can hope to detect this. So to, to actually measure the surface deformation, uh, these days the two main tools we rely on are GPS instruments and radar interferometry. And during the course of the Future Vault project, we've increased uh, our ability to use these, these instruments, uh, both, both techniques, uh, uh, substantially, I would say. So, uh, well, let, let me move forward to GPS first of all. So this is what a GPS instrument looks like. Um, that's someone sitting next to one. So on, on, the, on the left, uh, basically what, what we have there is an antenna. Uh, so it's the same principle, of course, as a, a normal GPS you might have in your car, but much, much more accurate because we, we use the phase. Um, and then the instrument is, is bolted onto the side of this. So this is, this is all fixed into the earth, and essentially we can measure the earth moving um, with millimetre kind of precision. So there's, a, there's a, a whole lot of these which are continuously monitoring the, the deformation now in Iceland. Uh, the one disadvantage, of course, is you get point measurements. Um, and the other technique, radar interferometry, which I'll introduce at the moment, is a, a good complement to address some of that issue. Um, another drawback, of course, is you have to install and maintain this, and, and that requires uh, quite some uh, resources and effort. And, and actually, the conditions can be rather difficult, of course, in, in Iceland compared to, to many other volcanic environments. <coughs> so what do you get from GPS? You get these kind of uh, time series plots. Uh, I'm showing you at the top, it's the north movement, then the east movement in the middle, and the, the vertical movement in the south, uh, in, in, in the bottom. Uh, so what we're seeing here, this is, a, 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 is mostly just due to plate tectonics, this, this gradual spreading of, of Iceland. Uh, in the horizontal, in the north and east, and in the bottom we're seeing uh, up and down movements as well due to um, removal and, uh, of, of ice and also snow during the winter. Um, plus there's a few offsets due to the aeophytical eruption. So if you're, if you're not sure whether we can really say something about pressure from deformation, there's a really nice example here um, during the, the 2011 Grimsbergen eruption. So the, the black wiggly line here is showing the pressure derived from a GPS station. Um, don't worry about the dotted line for now. Um, this red line, on the other hand, is showing accumulated volume of, of erupted material. And it basically tracks the, the inferred pressure change exactly. So you can see there's a really direct relationship between what's coming out and the pressure change we're inferring from the GPS. Um, the dotted line is, is, a, is a sort of best-fitting model, and actually this, of course, has some predictive capacity uh, if you wanted to understand when the eruption might end. So the other main technique we use is, is uh, radar interferometry, or also called interferometric synthetic aperture radar, in SAR is the acronym. And there are satellites orbiting the Earth, there are many more satellites now, um, and you heard in the first talk today um, that as a, as a supersite we get uh, a whole load of new data now that we didn't get before from, from lots of different satellites. satellites. So this is a, a great step forward. And in the past, this technique has mostly been used after the event, but now we can really use it for monitoring during, during crises as well. So the, the technique works by having radar satellites that essentially just measure the distance from the satellite to the Earth. And if you repeat these measurements later on, you can get the changes in the, in the, the distance to the Earth and, and infer this in terms of movement of the Earth. And we can produce these, these colorful kind of diagrams like this. Um, this is a, a so-called interferogram, but the color fringes here are showing us that you can think of them as contours of deformation. So if you have uh, two points like this, um, and we count up the number of color cycles in between, uh, we can infer how much one point has removed, uh, one point has moved with respect to the other, either towards or away from the satellite. So in this case, uh, the, the middle point here has moved up by about six centimeters or so. Now I should say the satellite is not quite directly above, so you have a little bit of horizontal movement as well, but it's, it's most, mostly vertical movements we pick up. So uh, moving um, closer to the present, this was the, the, the Badabung eruption. This is a, a really nice figure that kind of gives the overall deformation pattern associated 
uh, with this event, uh, what we can see is, um, well, let's go up here first. Um, let's go in here. There is um, deflation, so the ground is moving down as magma is moving from within this, beneath the central caldera here. Um, and then as the dike is propagated to the north, it's pushing the crust away and upwards. And you can, that's why you see these, these color cycles, color fringes, either side of the dike um, up here. I should add that this uh, technique is not particularly successful on, on ice. So that's one of, the, one of the issues we have to deal with. But it can be um, in, in, in special occasions. So we have very frequent revisit periods. We can get good measurements on ice as well. And that's what's shown here uh, within the caldera. This is a, a one-day one repeat. And there was some uh, 60 centimeters of displacement of, of substance in the caldera during this, this event. So um, I'm not showing you the fringes here because there are too many, but this is the, the integrated, the, uh, uh, the, the, the fringes counted up, if you like. So there's a lot of deformation there. And, and this, of course, these are the eruption sites here. Um, also plotted on here, by the way, is the seismicity, um, and that, that's shown by the gray dots. And what we'd, we'd like to do, of course, is to interpret the seismicity and the deformation together. Um, just to give you some idea of, of the, the contribution um, in, in terms of new DPS stations, uh, the black stations are, were existing stations before the, the, the Badawanga activity started. Um, and actually, two of these were already installed as part of the Future Vault project. But since, since the activity, a whole bunch of new, these, these red sites have been installed, and uh, there's a few more installations ongoing, shown by the open squares here. Okay, so what do the GPS show? Um, it's really, like I said, they're point measurements, but it's really nice because we have continuous measurements in time. And all these colored lines are essentially showing the, um, the, the route of the GPS station has taken. So if you look at this one here, as the, first of all, it was moving to the north, and then as the dike propagated past, it moved to the west, and then eventually slightly to the south of west in this direction here. So we can take all this, all this deformation information together and the seismicity, and we can, we can infer where the magma was at any particular time. So this diagram is showing us um, that we have time on the, the y-axis here. So this is at the, the beginning of the, the crisis on 16th of, of August. Um, and then each line represents another day. So it's showing us the progress of the dike. Um, so we can see in the, in the first day it reached uh, along six kilometers or so. The next day it got out to 17 kilometers. But it's also telling us the amount of magma at each, each segment uh, along the dike. So for instance, you can see that it paused at this point for several days, but during the pause, the amount of magma actually increased, so the, the pressure was increasing um, at the end of that dike segment. And then we can, we can take, take all of this together and look at the, the overall opening of the dike. So this was using both seismicity and deformation data together. Um, and what we can see is that actually, so we, we're using the seismicity to, to tell us the lateral path of the dike. Um, and in terms of lateral path, it's a very good indicator. In terms of the depth, what it's really telling us is where, where the bottom of the dike is. Um, and we can see that, in fact, if we, if the, the red colors here represent more opening. And we can see that most of the opening was actually quite close to the surface, um, most of the way along the dike. Um, you, you might notice from this that it's taken, and also from the previous talk, that the, the dike took a very circuitous route. Um, it's maybe hard to understand at first, but actually um, we, we've looked at this a little bit more, and if you consider both the, the strain the and the gravitational potential energy involved, the changes involved, then actually it, it does make quite some sense. So this is a kind of probability distribution of, of where the dike would propagate to um, if it started where it did start. And what we can see, there's a really high probability that it would propagate to the south, and this is what happened actually in, in 1996 in the, the Gelb eruption. Um, but if it goes off in this direction, um, we can see that the actual route taken by the dike pretty much followed the, the most probable path that you would expect, given the consideration of the energy. So associated with this, this, this dike event, there was a, and then the subsequent eruption, of course, there was this, this huge collapse of the caldera that's been mentioned already. Um, this figure on the left here is, is showing the overall pattern of substance, and there's up to you know, 60 meters or so of substance. Um, and there's a whole bunch of measurements that, that went into monitoring this. So as well as using our, our radar techniques, um, optical satellites were used, and also lots of flights were made over, um, over the caldera using radar and radar altimetry to measure this. So this is just showing you a kind of progression uh, with time of, of the, the substance in the caldera. 
Um, oh, I should add, there was also a GPS station installed um, within the caldera, and this, this gives us, the, again, very nicely the, the temporal evolution of the, the substance. So we, we, can, we, can, we can model this in some, some sort of simple way, as if we consider a magma chamber, um, a link to the, a conduit to the surface for uh, feeding the eruption, and then some sort of piston with friction on the sides, um, gradually moving down. And this enables us to, to, to couple together the measurements we see from the deformation and also the, uh, the measurements we can make of the, the lava flowing out. Um, and, um, and this is just showing you one example of that. So the, the green dots here are showing the, the GPS measurements, so the vertical GPS measurements. So basically you can see that it, it's, it's moving down with time, but it's actually slowing in rate. Um, so we can fit a model to that. Um, and then this is useful because, of course, well, it's useful in many ways, but one, one thing is that it has predictive capacity, again, uh, in terms of when it might start, uh, stop, I should say. So just to, to summarize this, I mean, re really the, the point is that if we can measure deformation, this can really, we can interpret this in terms of uh, where the magma is, and this is a very important tool in terms of monitoring uh, and also in, in terms of the science. Uh, and by, by monitoring the evolution of this deformation, then we can, we can also use this in some sort of predicted capacity in terms of where the magma's going um, and where it might erupt at, at any time, and also when it might stop, stop erupting. So FutureVolk has, has, has really increased our ability to, to make these measurements. In terms of GPS, uh, we have many more instruments out there now. Um, we have the, the, these are all, the, the data are fed in automatically, processed automatically um, in, in, in real time. In terms of the inside data now, we have many more data. Um, these are also near real time now, so whereas we used to get the data uh, days after they were required, now we get them sometimes just within hours, and we have, we have we've developed new processing algorithms to, to process these really r rapidly, and so we can use these data in a monitoring capacity. So this is really quite new. So thanks very much, I'm happy to take any questions.